in the room and also to you online. Good to have you here today. There was three golfers got a car accident and all three of them died and went to heaven. And uh, they were absolutely just so surprised and delighted when they got to heaven. The first thing they saw was a huge golf course. So they asked St. Peter, can we play golf? They said, sure, all the golf you want. Only one condition. They said, don't hit the ducks. See, there are millions of ducks up here, he says. And if you hit one of them, they start squawking, and the other one starts squawking. Next thing you know, I mean, there were just about a million squawking, and this messes up the tranquility. So have at it, play all the golf you want, just don't hit the ducks. So it went okay for about a week, and then, sure enough, one of the golfers hit a duck. It went on for St. Peter came, and, well, I don't exactly know how to say it. Let's just say he had, he had a lady with him that was um, homely. And he had a pair of handcuffs. So he said to the guy who hit the duck, handcuffed the lady to him and said, for eternity. Well, another week goes by and sure enough, the second guy hit the duck. Here comes St. Pete. Had with him a more homely lady. Handcuffs, hooked him up for eternity. Well, they... Made it good for about a month, and so nothing happened. And so, next thing you know, St. Pete shows up and got this gorgeous girl with him and a pair of handcuffs and handcuffed it to the last guy and said, For all eternity. And the guy says, Wow, as St. Pete was walking off, he said, Wow, I don't know what I did to deserve this. And the lady says, I don't either. All I know is I hit a duck. All right, end times. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about the rapture. The rapture of God's people, the rapture of the church, the rapture of God's kids. And uh, the rapture, we'll talk about the meaning of But let's take a, a review here just real quick. We're looking at ages past and ages to come and what happens in the middle. And we start here with the first coming of Christ when he was born here. And then after Christ here, we are now in what is called the church age. And we'll be in the church age, the age of grace, the age of God doing what he's doing until the next great event happens. And I think it's entirely possible for it to happen in our lifetime. The great next prophetic event that will happen is the rapture. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But after the rapture, then we'll have seven years of what's called tribulation when, when all hell is broken loose on the earth. And the reason that is, as I mentioned the other week, is because what's holding that back right now is the church. And when the church and God's people are gone, then things are going to just head downhill rapidly. And it's divided, seven years is divided up into three and a half years. And the last three and a half years is going to be the worst. The Antichrist is going to rule the world. And uh, you'll have things that we'll talk about later that's going to go on during that period of time. Just not good. Then we have what is called the second coming. Now, a lot of times people mix up, and, and part of the reason they mix it up is because we mix it up. Because it's not unusual to hear a Christian or somebody talk about the rapture as the second coming. And it makes sense, because if this is the first coming, then the, when the rapture happens and he comes, that technically seems like it should be the second, right? And in that sense, it is. But the difference is this. Is the rapture, when Jesus comes back, and we'll read about it in a moment, he comes in the air and never touches the planet. And we who are alive are going to be caught up, and those also who have gone on ahead of us, they're going to come, be resurrected, and we're going to meet him in the air. This second coming is at the end of the tribulation period and Christ is going to come and put his foot down on the Mount of Olivet in Jerusalem and then he will, we will come with him, those of us who are in heaven will come with him and then he will set up his kingdom. He'll take the devil and, and all his other demons, chain them up and put them in, in a holding place. They won't be in hell yet. But for a thousand years, Christ is going to set up his rule and reign, and we'll rule and reign with him. At the end of that thousand years, 
That's what's called the millennial. Millennial reign. At the end of that thousand years, Satan will be loosed again for a period of time. And then after that period of time, then uh, uh, Jesus will take him and all of his imps and throw him into hell, which was made for him. Uh, it was not made for you. It was not made for me. It was made for him. And so that's kind of the, the overall picture. Now, we're going to read a, a scripture out of the book of Thessalonians. But I want to give you the backdrop of why Paul is writing this. The Apostle Paul was a missionary. And he would go around and he would go to places like he would go to Charleston and teach for a while. And then he'd come to North Charleston. And then he'd go to Monk's Corner. And around the other side of Monk's Corner is this place called Thessalonica. <laughs> it's a town over there called Thessalonica. And the Thessalonians are the people who live in Thessalonica. And so Paul goes to Thessalonica and stays there for a bit and teaches them. Guess what he teaches them while he's there? He teaches them what I'm teaching you. And he's talking about the end times and what's going to happen. And about Jesus coming back and all this stuff. And so then after that's up, he goes to another city. Well, after he leaves, they, I mean, they get the idea, he's coming back now. He's coming back soon. Well, time goes by and Jesus didn't come by, back. And now some of the people that heard Paul teach are dying. And now they get worried. They said, did we miss them? They're not going to be here for the resurrection. I mean, I'll be here for the coming of Christ. And they get all confused. Well, the word gets to Paul. The Thessalonians on the other side of Monk's Corner are really confused about all this stuff. And so Paul sets down and he writes them a letter. And that's where we get the book of Thessalonians from. And he addresses this issue. Now, listen as he addresses this issue with these guys, and he tries to, to clear up the confusion. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, that God will bring him back, bring, bring back, bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living... You think you might be? Let me ask you a question. Would it be okay with you if you were still alive? Would that be okay? Are you sure? How many of you don't know? You don't think you can fly too good. I think it would be cool. Yeah, I think it would be cool. Be here and then gone. All right, for the Lord himself will come down from, from heaven with a commanding what? And the voice of a? And with the trumpet of the Lord, of God. First now, Christians who have died will rise from the graves. So who will come first? Christians who died. Then after that, together with them, as they come from the graves, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up. That's where we get the word rapture, caught up, this word caught up, into where? See, that's the reason I told you. Don't come to earth, we go to him. Now, once we're there, though, we'll meet the Lord in the? And then we'll be with the Lord for how long? Forever. So once this rapture happens, we're gone, baby, and we're with the Lord forever. So encourage one another with these words. Encouragement. Now, the word that's used here, caught up, it means to be taken up. It means to be snatched. Uh, the best way I, I can identify with that is being a boy and was doing something wrong and my mom got a hold of me. It was like the rapture. I was caught up. I mean, I was, I was, I was snatched up. I mean, she was fast. Now look what 1 Corinthians says. Paul, the same guy who wrote that is writing Corinthians now. Now, <clears throat> what I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We, we were built to be here. We are spirit beings inside, which we can relate to God. But we, are, we, are, we, we come from the earth, we come from the dust, and where are we going back? To the dust. But when we change homes, we take off this house... And we put on another house. He says it this way. 
These dying bodies cannot inherit that which will last forever. That's the change. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. We'll be changed. It will happen in a moment. In the what? Now that phrase right there, that phrase, is that's, that's the word we get the word atomic from. It's, 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 it's the word that is an in, indivisible amount of time. It's the shortest period of time. Chuck Mishler says that they have it now to 10 to the 43rd degree is the smallest amount of time you can have this indivisible. You can't, go in, you can't divide it one more time. It's like this, we're gone. And I heard somebody between services saying, well, we kind of like float up and we can wave to each other as we're going up <laughs> and talk, talk and have a conversation, a cup of coffee on the way up. No. I mean, this is, this is atomic. This is, boom, quicker than you could imagine. We are there. And in that same process, we are changed. Will our bodies go up? Yes. And our bodies will be changed. We, we will put on immortality. Look what it says. It happened in a moment, a blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for the trumpet sounds, the all who have died will be raised forever, will live and be transformed. That transformation, that, that changing, it's like, it's like looking at a house on a, on a piece of paper, laid out and drawn out, one dimension, and then all of a sudden the house is built and it becomes three-dimensional. We are like one dimension then, all of a sudden we'll be changed and we'll be multi-dimensional. We'll be like him. We'll be changed into his likeness. Our mortality will put on immortality. A body that was born to die will have now a body that lives, <coughs> excuse me, will live forever. We'll be like him. Now, this is, <clears throat> I know a lot of people have questions like, how, how is he going, how, these people are not in the graves anymore. And then how about the people that sharks have eaten? <laughs> how are they going to get back? How about, how about people been eaten by cannibals? I know you have some questions like that. <laughs> I don't think God has any trouble at all figuring out how to get the DNA that was once somebody's body that's gone back to dust to separate it to get it to come back out. I, I think you can be relaxed about that. It's cool. He can, he can handle that. Just be ready. Just be ready. I mean, even, even it's not as strange as, as you think. If, if you go back even to Abraham's day, back in the very first, chat, first uh, book of the Bible, there was another book that was written about that time. And it was the book of Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible. And in the book of Job, Job even is thinking, he, how does he know this? Here, here's what Job is thinking way back then. He says it this way. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter days upon the earth. And though after my skin the worms destroyed this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself, my eyes shall behold, and not another. That's, I, I, will stand, I will see it. I believe in a resurrection, Job was saying, way back then. He, he knew, though his body was gone, the worms had eaten it, he knew he was going to be standing in front of the Lord one day and standing face to face with him. It's not a new concept. All the way back again to Genesis. There was a guy, anybody remember the guy named Enoch? A little fascinating thing about Enoch, he never died. It says, Enoch walked with the Lord and the Lord took him. And the common saying is this, is like with Adam and Eve, God came in the cool of the afternoon and walked with them. And so he's walking with Enoch now. And they're walking along. And then at the end of the day, God turns to Enoch and says, you know, we're closer to my house than yours, so why don't you come on home with me? And so he went on home, never died. He was changed. 
He was raptured. His body went from mortal to immortality, just like that. He just walked right on into it. The rapture had happened. There's a guy named Elijah. Anybody remember Elijah? Never died. Was raptured. God took him. His body was changed. All this is just, is just kind of setting the stage for Jesus himself. Y'all know the stories oftentimes told around Easter and possibly some other times of the year were how badly Jesus was beaten. And it was bad. I mean, they had the cat of nine tails and had metal and glass on, mixed up in the whip itself and it would wrap around him and then they would jerk it and it would tear big hunks out of him. And, and a lot of people never even survived that and they died with the whip in itself. And that's, that's beyond being beaten what the soldiers did. That's beyond being nailed to the cross. And when he, by the time he hung on the cross and by the time he finally died, what kind of shape was he in? But how long did he stay? How long was he dead? And then he did what? He did what we're going to do. He was changed. And he came back. And he had a physical body. And he ate. And he talked to the disciples. They touched him. And do you know, in that three days, all that happened to him went away. And the old boy was doing pretty good. Now, some of you can look forward to that because you got up this morning thinking, oh, my. Uh, I need something to straighten up this body. I'm, oh, the rapture. My knees. But see, Jesus, he, the same thing happened to him. But he came back. And he, he, he was even, this, the, this dimension thing, which is intriguing to me, and I, I can't get into it. Uh, but there are dimensions, you know. Uh, and I've often said this, this, this is not it's solid to us. But there's a dimension where there's more space in this table. You know, that there are atoms and stuff going around, the molecules and there's going around. There's a lot of space inside that table. If you could be in a dimension, you might could do what Jesus did and walk right in a room and never have to use the door. He walked right through it into a room. We're going to be changed to be like him. Now, <clears throat> there's another guy. In the book of Acts, there was a guy named Philip. Philip was going along, and the Bible says he noticed another guy that was journeying and traveling, and he was an Ethiopian. And that he was reading from the Old Testament. And it, got, it just got Philip interested in it. So he asked him, he said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no, I don't. He said, well, let me tell you. So he introduced him to, uh, to the story of Jesus. He accepted Christ, and so he was saved. So much so until they were going on along together now. And the, the Ethiopian said, well, there's some water. Can I be baptized? And he says, yes. So he baptized him. But the interesting thing happened. When they came up out of the water, Philip was gone just like that. And he shows up just like that. He shows up in another city and was walking around in another city. Right after transformed, changed. Somebody says, Mike, what if I'm in the shower when he comes? <laughs> Jimmy Evans says, I hope you've been working out. <laughs> but just, just for a point of reference, in that, in that scripture about Philip, when he shows up in this other city, he had clothes on. So relax. <laughs> relax, yeah? And when we come back, in Revelation, we said we come back with Jesus at the second coming. When he comes back to establish his rule for a thousand years, we come back with him riding on horses. And we are wearing white linen. So you'll be okay. Now let's look at Jesus explaining the rapture now. Here you go. Uh, let's begin in Luke chapter 17, verse 24. <clears throat> For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so it would be on the day when what happens? When the Son of Man comes. Now, so he's talking about what happens in the air. He's coming in the air, he's coming. But first, the Son of Man must suffer terrible and, and, and be rejected by this generation. 
And let's go back to the reference. When the Son of Man comes back, it will be as, if, as it was in the days of Noah. And also in the days of the Son of Man. They look at what they're doing. They're eating. They're drinking. They're getting married. They're giving in marriage until that day. Until what? Until what day? That day where Noah did what? Enter the ark. That day, everything changed. Everything was normal. Everything was as usual until that day. And the flood came and destroyed them all. There is a day. There is a that day. Likewise, he gives a second illustration now, Jesus does. As, as, uh, likewise, as it also was in the day of Lot. They were doing what? They were eating, drinking. Ladies were going shopping and buying stuff. Hmm. They sold stuff. They planted. They built. Everything was going on as normal, yes? But on that day, the day that Lot went out of Sodom, that day, everything changed. That day, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed all of them. Even so, it will be, and the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, we'll be on the housetop, and it says, his goods are in the house. Don't go down and get them. Uh, likewise, when to be in the field, don't turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. I tell you that that night, there'll be two men in a bed, and one will be taken, and the other what? Left. Left. The two women will be grinding their grain together. They'll be working. This was in, in the agrarian culture. Grinding the grain together. One will be taken and what? <clears throat> two will be in the field. One will be taken the other left. And so they answered Jesus and said, and said, Where, Lord? And he said, said to them, Where the body is, there is eagles. They're talking about the air. And they'll be gathered all together. Where? In the clouds, in the air, we'll meet together. All right. So what he's, what he's saying here, is this whole concept about that day. And I think it's the same concept with the tribulation. Uh, some people, and I'm not going to go into it, but some people believe in, what, in a, what's called a pre-trib, the rapture before the, trib, the tribulation, which uh, I believe. Some people believe it's in the middle of the tribulation, mid-trib people. Some people think it's at the very end, you know, and so you got post-trib. So you have all those beliefs. <clears throat> One of the reasons I believe it's pre-trib is these scriptures, and there's others. But if you look at it, because what's going to happen as the church leaves, I think it is that day. Because if you look at it during the tribulation, it's not a normal carry-on business as usual. There are periods of time in the tribulation where a third of the people are killed in the tribulation. There's another time where there's a fourth of the people on earth killed during the tribulation. There's another time in the tribulation where the sea is totally destroyed. And so those are times, not times, where you're going about marrying and drinking and planning. No, you, you're, we'll read some scripture in a moment. You, you are trying to survive and headed for the hills and all kind of stuff. But I think when it, when it says... That day, Noah was, had talked to the people. They didn't believe him. They were mocking him. No one wanted to get on board with him. And so everything was fine. Never rained until that day. That day when the ark was closed, that day it was over. Rain started. That day, I mean, he, the angels, see, uh, Lot, Abraham was Lot's uncle. And so he, he, they were journeying together through life until they had to divide because the herds got too big. And Lot chose to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. It ended up being a terrible, terrible move. And so when God said, I've got to destroy it because it is so wicked, he couldn't do it because Lot and his family was there. Could I, could I say it this way? He couldn't bring the judgment because the church was still there. He couldn't bring... The plague, because the church was still there. And so he sent the angels to get Lot out and his family out. So he goes to get Lot out. He could not destroy it 
until that day. And that day, when they walked out of Sodom and Gomorrah, that day, the brimstone fell. It's that that day, when Christ comes in the air, when the trump sounds, that day, the church is going to be removed. And that day, or soon afterwards, that's when the, when the presence of the church gone, evil is going to have play. Now, <clears throat> Let me, let me just talk for a moment to you ladies. <clears throat> How many of you are single here? Okay. Just hold your hands high so everybody can see. So. <laughs> I tell you what, you, why, don't you, why don't you, every, every lady here, imagine you're single, okay? Take a break for a moment. <laughs> get, get happy again. Come on. Just, just, <laughs> Take, take a break, all right? You're, you're single. What if you met the most wonderful man? And what if you're trying to, first of all, you're kind of trying to size him up, and, you know, you don't pay attention to his looks, first of all. <laughs> but, you, yeah, you do. He is, a, <laughs> he, is, he is a hunk. I mean, he is, he's a looker. Yep. And then you get past the looks, and he is just the most... Caring, he is the most sensitive person. It's like he knows what you're thinking before you ever talk. And it's like he, when he speaks and when he says things, it, like it just massages your heart. It just, it, he talks, it just does you good. I mean, some of you married folks are still looking for that man. <laughs> I mean, it just does, it just does. And he's, a, and, and y'all fall in love together. And you, oh, he, you, you're just so happy you're in love. So happy. And then he asks you the question. Uh, I'm, I might ask you to marry me. And you're thinking, okay. But he said, before I do that, I got one caveat. I'm going to turn you over for seven years to the worst human being that ever existed. And you're going to be under his domain to persecute you for seven years, to have his way with you for seven years. He, he'll probably kill you. A lot of beheading is going to go on during tribulation. And it probably will be yours, but it'll do you good. Now, will you marry me? No. <laughs> you get the picture? Well, there's another reason I don't think the bride, the church, will go through the tribulation. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to have some hard times because let me, let me just say this. There are places on earth right now where Christians are that it could be the tribulation for them. I mean, there are people dying for the gospel today around the world. So I'm not saying you're not going to have hard times. I'm just saying when the wrath comes, or the wrath of God comes, I don't think you will be a part of it. The other part of this has to do with the language that's used even used by Jesus, when Jesus is with his disciples and he's getting ready to go to the cross, he has this last supper with them. And, and the language he uses is so much, and I know it's strange for us guys to, to really settle down in the fact that we are part of the bride of Christ. We are. And that he, he's going to come back and get us. And there is going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. When he, when he comes back, there's going to be Marriage supper, I'll say more about it a little later. But, but Jesus uses this language. He's with his disciples, and here's what he says. Listen to this. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I go to prepare a place for you. I will come and receive you to uh, myself. That where I am, you may be also. That word, receive you to myself, that is straight out of the wedding manuals. I mean, the language and what happens here and what he's setting up is a classic Jewish wedding. I mean, so what he says to what happens in the Jewish weddings is, is they, they would come and first of all, they would have a dowry and then they would, uh, he would propose, ask her to marry him and so... The dowry would be set, and they would take care of that. 
And then they would literally have a contract oftentimes and, and with the bride's parents. And then the, the groom would say to them, well, they would have a glass of wine and they would have this wine as a part of their covenant together, the, the bride to be and the groom. This is, the, this is what Mary and Joseph did. This was the betrothal. This is the engagement. What we going? It was the betrothal. And they would take the wine and it would be a covenant. And he would say to her, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. Remember this? They don't forget it. And they would, they would seal the contract or the covenant with the wine. And then he would leave and go home to his dad's house. And it was a custom of their day. And still a lot of places around the world, they do it this way. And then they would build a room onto the dad's place or another story, someplace where they were going to live. And the common time frame was about a year. And then they would let, let her know because they, he would take his buddies and they would have these torches. And you could see them coming over the hillside and coming into the little town. And he would come at midnight and come and get, the, get her and then take her back to dad's house for the wedding. And you can see a lot of imagery in that. Those of you who know the Bible about the virgins and the midnight call and the oil and a lot of similarities. And so they would, she would be there and they would have things set up. She would come out and dress and all of her stuff for the wedding with them fully veiled. And they would have the ceremony. Then they would go back into the bridal chambers and stay. And the rest of the party would stay out. And they would party for sometimes up to a week. And then the last day or so, the bride and groom would come back out. Now she would be unveiled and they would participate. Well, <clears throat> Jesus is using this same language, marriage language, when he took the cup and said to the disciples, I'm going away. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Do you see it? And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself. The marriage will happen. And when we go back after the rapture, when we go back up to heaven, while the tribulation stuff is going on, there's going to be a big wedding, a wedding feast and it's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's exactly what they did. But it's going to be longer than a week. And so we're going to be up there having a party together Aren't y'all glad we're all going to be together? Aren't you glad you're going to be with your family and friends and uh, folks who love you and love God for all eternity? We're going to be together? And so, but you have to understand that language to understand the whole concept of another reason I don't think it is during the tribulation. Look what verse 29 says and 30 of Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation in those days, the sun will darken, the moon will not give its light, stars will fall from the heaven, and powers of the heaven will be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That is the second coming. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, let me ask you a question, because a lot of folks ask this question. They said, you heard somebody ask on the, on the screen, why, why a rapture anyway? I mean, why can't things keep on going like they're going? Well, because the, the judgment thing has to happen, and God has to wrap this thing up, because he's going to get on with his future plan. And so, one is, he is the bride. I mean, he is the groom, remember? And he's anxious to come back for his bride. Do you, do you realize Jesus loves you? I mean, this, this guy died for his bride. And he, he anxiously awaits the time where he can come and we can be together again. I mean, it is the greatest love story forever, friends. It is. Uh, the second thing is that he wants to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. Because it's coming. Look at Revelation 6, 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves. Now, this is a time where I promise you things are not like normal. 
hid themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath, the great day of his what? That's what his bride doesn't go through. His wrath. <clears throat> Verse 9, First <clears throat> Thessalonians. For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of, of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from the idols and served the living and true God. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of hope and salvation. Read this verse 9 with me, if you will. For God did not appoint us to what? Did not. But obtained salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, and whether we awake or sleep, shall live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other with these words and edify one another with these words. What words? You don't go through the wrath. Well, let's reverse it and see how you feel. I want to edify you. I want you to feel better. You're going through the wrath. Probably get your head cut off. All right, you may make it with one arm, one leg. You feel better? Now comfort one another with these words. And there's hope. There's hope. In Luke, it says the time comes as a snare. Not, not, not for us. Count it worthy, it says, if you can escape. Why would he tell us to count it worthy to escape if we couldn't escape? <clears throat> the rain will start as in Noah's day. Now, that day will happen. And that day, I got one more question for you. And that day, will your children go up? Well, let me ask you a better question. Will your animals go up? Will your dogs go? Yep. How about your cats? Now, we had a dog that I know is not going to make it. <laughs> I can promise you we had one dog. I know where he is. Again, let me just be practical with you for a moment. Just, just practical father. Okay. What if, what if God would say to you, I'm coming back, the rapture's going to happen, but your children will not go. How many of you would say, well, I don't want to go. If my kids can't go, I'm not about to leave them. Say you had one ten, one six, one four. Would you leave them? Who gave you that heart? I think the father did. So I think I think your children are covered until what's typically called the age of accountability. Now no one knows what that age is. They usually say twelve. If you're Jews, they say 13, because the, the Jews' boys have a bar mitzvah, of which they literally come into adulthood. The girls have bat mitzvah, and they become, literally, they become responsible young women at that point, and then responsible for their behavior. But you know what I find fascinating? That in some, you know, just according to which part of Israel you go in, some parts of Israel, the girl becomes an adult at 12 instead of 13 younger than the guys. Do you believe that? You think the girls can mature more than the guys faster? <laughs> sure, that is true. But whatever that age is, now it, it, take in, it takes in accountability of God understands the whole system. And the problem with children and, and can go all the way up and they will go to heaven for whatever they have wrong with them if they don't understand a lot. God's a just and good God in that sense. But whatever that age is, when they know right and wrong, when they take responsibility, that now after that, they're on their own. That's the reason why, friends, as a parent, your number one responsibility for your children, number one goal of your children, is to have them to come to the Lord Jesus at the earliest age possible. 
that's your number one goal in life. But you want that, that deal sealed with your child, with your children. Now, I want to ask you a question one more time. Um, would it be all right if he came in your lifetime? Would it be all right if he came today? Are you ready to go today? Online, are you ready? Because it is the next major prophetic event to happen. And hit, this thing is wrapping up without a shadow of a doubt. Can you sense it? I can sense it. Yeah. We're headed, and I don't know when it's going to be, but we're moving down that way pretty quickly. Let me... How many of you know, did y'all pick up the scripture, that we're not going to be the first one to start heading up? Who's going to be the first one? Are you the, the dead in Christ? Are you telling me that when Jesus has that shout and that trumpet, are you telling me that the grave can't hold him? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying to me there is no grave that can keep you down? Huh? Are you sure? I think you need to hear something about that grave before you go, okay? Take a listen. All right. This is going to be the most upbeat altar call you have ever heard. Those of you online, those of you here, I want y'all to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I'm walking out of this grave. Now you rose from the dead. Raise me from the dead. Forgive me of my sins. I'm walking out of this grave. Adopt me into your family. I'm walking out of this grave. I'm giving you my life. Because I'm walking out of this grave. And I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I'm out. I'm out. Amen. Now, if you pray that prayer, here or, or at home or wherever you're watching this, you are saved, my friend. You are saved. When the rapture comes, me and you, we going, baby. Because you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Give everybody a hand who just prayed that prayer for a minute. Lord bless you, Lord keep you, Lord cause his face to shine upon you. And I'm looking forward for us going together, caught up at one time to be together forever and ever and ever. I'm looking forward to being in the marriage supper of the Lamb with you guys. Going down and visiting your mansions with you. Sitting on your front porch together. I, I think we can do some fishing up there together, don't you? All right, Lord bless you guys. See you next week. Have a great week.